put it in AR3133. AR3133. Nice. I'll just change the title for that. Anyway, so how you might approach discussing uh, traffic congestion in your different areas. For example, uh, where is that? Okay, here. This intersection in uh, near Ayala. So let me just zoom out a bit. Okay, notice the traffic conditions are slow going to Ayala, but um, going away from Ayala, it's already green. So meaning uh, not so much people uh, leaving Ayala uh, typically. So this is typical traffic in Google Maps. But as you um, as you may as as you may have experienced, a lot of people really want to go to Ayala uh, during pre-pandemic times, and even during pandemic times, it's a major um, commercial area. Like people work here, people shop here, people eat here. So if you look at this, is uh, intersection between N. Escario Street and Molave Street. You can like break down. Let me see here. Where's my image? Where are the uh, vehicles going? How fast estimate do you think you're going based on your experience? If you live in this area, you'll be familiar. Uh, for me, based on my experience, uh, this area is uh, very easily like around 40 to 50 kilometers per hour, like driving here. And then I this uh, yellow and red line with the different uh, with the broken art with the broken lines <laughs> is my proposed route for cyclists uh, and then some issues i raised here uh, motorized vehicles coming from uh, three directions at 40 kilometers per hour or faster so you have uh, coming from the ayala and this one is uh, going to ayala and then you have uh, a couple of vehicles at, and then in the intersection going towards the residential areas over here in red. So this is a very, um, if you're a cyclist, uh, dangerous situation uh, where you need to be super aware and it's not very comfortable because uh, it's loud, a lot of vehicles, not good. Uh, let's see, speed needs to be reduced. So uh, how do you reduce the speeds from uh, 40 to like something more safe for cyclists, which is like maximum 30 kilometers per hour. You can think about uh, what they call it, people walking. Um, one of the standards that have been uh, repeated over and over again by the Netherlands is that a person can survive a hit uh, from a car moving at 30 kilometers per hour max. So maximum 30 kilometers per hour. 40 kilometers per hour, you're likely to get major injuries and die. So 30 kilometers, you get broken bones, etc., but you won't die. <laughs> so we can talk about things like traffic calming. As we discussed a few months ago, you can go back to that module, reducing the length, the width of the road. I'm sure like you all know that all the drivers will hate that, but really it's all about increasing mobility. And if you think about it, how many people can you fit in a car? A car is about two by three. Uh, estimate uh, two two meters wide by three meters long and if you can fit five people in there that's already good but in that two by three or six square meters you can very easily fit um let's see let me draw it out let's use autocad so it's actually scaled how many people can you fit in a two by three space a two by three space is bedroom size People standing in a two by three space very easily can fit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe even 10 people. So let me just open up this. Anyway, I have a lot of feelings about this uh, topic. So two by three, uh, two and CF. Let's say shoulder to shoulder width of a person's about 0.5. Uh, let's see, maybe 0.6. So let's say a person is, how thick is a person? I'll say 0.1. <laughs> and then they're about 0.6 wide. So that's a very rectangular person. 0.1 is like too, too thin. 0.6 is too wide, actually. How big are my hips? <laughs> it's about maybe like 0.4. Yeah, 0.4 and 0.1. So CL. And then his head, a person's head would be somewhere around 
right here, something like that. So that's I'm looking at plan view of a person, by the way. So that's this is a uh, two meters. Let me turn on my snaps. Two meters by three. I think two meters by three is too big for a car. A car would be like 1.5. 1 1.5 1 by yeah. Anyway. Say how big 1.5 is. Oh, 1.5. Car, let me, let's say two meters, 2.5. It's about the proportion of a car. And then in that same area, you can fit very easily. Just like estimating. Let's see how many people is that. That's six, 12 people easily double the number of people you can fit in a car. So that's basically the concept of mobility. Um, walking, you get a, a street can accommodate almost uh, like a, a strip of street almost accommodates maybe double or triple the number of people in a car. The only problem is that people walking can't go as far. So this is where urban and regional planning comes in, where the policies have to account or have to be sensitive to people walking. And if you notice the most livable cities, Melbourne, um, Canada, uh, not so much in the US, the US is very car centric, although there are some cities in the US that are uh, uh, what do you call this? Walkable, meaning friendly to people who just walk, who don't own cars. Like Boston, I think. Anyway, uh, the most livable cities are also, they're not the richest, but they're doing well enough where it's clean, people are comfortable, there's jobs, and not much poverty, not much hunger. So walkability is one issue for that. So you could discuss something like that. And then over here, intersection two, this is the area where there's a flyover. You see there is this, I forgot the name of this building. What's this building called? The Pag-ibig building. Uh, I don't know why I blanked on that. And this is just a nightmare for cyclists, this kind of area. <laughs> so if it's a nightmare for cyclists, it's also a nightmare for people walking. So this island here, not very... <laughs> friendly. Uh, I'm sure any Europeans who would be walking here would be terrified, but the uh, Filipinos just got used to it. Uh, Cebuanos as well. Um, we have cars coming in here. Uh, at least it's one way. The island is very small, but then you have cars behind you going over there. Uh, the only benefit of this area is the speeds are very low because cars are like conscious. Uh, they don't want to speed in this area, but this area here in the middle is just a nightmare. Um, if you're walking and you want to cross this area here, it's really impossible. That's why they have the pedestrian walk over here. So minimizing the number of cars coming in from different directions from four to two. And then um, initially I wanted like a cycling lane to go through here, but like upon further inspection, it's really a bad idea, especially if you want to go underneath this flyover. A lot better to follow this uh, pedestrian, um, what do you call this, lane. So there's, there's, there's been one article that says if, an, if a city is cyclable, uh, cyclo friendly, it's also uh, walkable. Uh, it's also walkable. So that article I just saw this morning, or was it yesterday evening? So you can use like these ideas like this. So Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, they have a Twitter. Uh, I think they don't have a Facebook page. You can go to their website. They also have a website. And then you can look at these sort of very common sense principles, which is uh, makes you wonder why it's not being applied uh, everywhere else. So cycling track, short and street crossing distances, uh, the most obvious benefit of cycling infrastructure to people on foot. They don't have to cross as many lanes of motorized traffic when they walk across the street. So cycling islands uh, reduce the, what they call this, the road width the vehicle road width because uh, they need an area to like rest uh, while crossing or um, they just have their own separate lane and make the cars wait. So having cars stop or wait 
uh, will be will be better for pedestrians and cyclists and then yeah it should be more comfortable to walk and cycle in that area another one is cycling can reduce the volume of motor vehicles in combination with a reliable public transport network that's something um, I wouldn't I don't think you can call Philippine transport public transportation reliable um, I guess it's reliable it's always easy to find a Jeep or a CCAD uh, but safe is probably not one. <laughs> uh, maybe he's riding a Jeep is safe. Sika is safe. Uh, as long as you, uh, your driver is a good driver. Um, let's see. Cycling has the potential to reduce the volume of motor vehicles by directly replacing car trips. So if there is good cycling infrastructure, people might be more motivated to cycle instead of use their cars. Or alternatively, those who can't afford cars will cycle instead and then um, yeah you'll have more people on cycles i think the very unique issue in cebu city right now is the very high number of uh, motorized um not very motorized motorcycles and then i think we need to instead of forcing them to stop because they're already there it's a lot harder to make people stop um for me anyway I think it would be a benefit for, excuse me, yes. Cebu City to like work with these uh, motorcycle people instead, because yeah, already there is this tension uh, for the past I don't know 50 years between the government and the people. So if they just sort of try, it's, that's really the issue. How do we get them to communicate? The government has such a both the government and the people have such a animosity towards each other. Like they don't see eye to eye. People think government is always corrupt, which unfortunately they kind of are. And the government thinks that people are just stupid, so they don't put include them in plans. So we're, we in the academe, students and teachers, our role is to sort of bridge that gap, like uh, educate those who are uneducated and uh make the uh what do you call this uh make the government accountable or consult the government uh so that they make better decisions and uh pro pro propose or approve uh better policies that are more relevant and more meaningful so not just like doing whatever they want <laughs> anyway there's like 10 principles here you can go through each of them you can go to the uh, Dutch Embassy web uh, Twitter page. This is also one of the uh, small sin silver linings of the pandemic because these kinds of organizations are forced to become more online, having their websites more open if they were already open, and then just like putting out more material for free. For free, huh? And yeah, thank goodness to uh, these people. <laughs> they have PDFs, they have books can download them for free. And if you can't download something, you can like, let me know and I, I can use my uh, teacher account to get, get you free stuff. <laughs> okay, I'll stop recording here. That's pretty much it for that question.